I think for women, you have to know what turns you on. You're, you are the owner of your orgasm. Okay. And a lot of women, I've talked to many women well over 40 years old who have never masturbated before. Oh God. And so they're like, so what do you do? You just yeah. lay there and you touch yourself. So remember, you are the owner of your orgasm. Mm -hmm. It's like nobody can paint your house the color until you tell them what color to paint it. Yeah. You have to decide the color to paint mm -hmm. the wall. <laughs> like the painter can't just guess. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to be different color than the person who lived in that house before. Welcome to Her Drive Podcast, a female-focused interview series with women of the world discussing their road trips to success. I'm your host, Cindy Kramblatt, a travel expert, business owner, and curious spirit with a knack for meeting fascinating women. Please join me as I hop in the passenger seat and chat with these ambitious women about what drives them, twists and turns, and those pedal to the metal moments. Let's drive. So without further ado, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Sanjay, it's such a pleasure to be sitting down with you. I oh, did you. like unofficially meet you at a class a few months ago at Weem, and it was phenomenal. I'm so glad that I came and I have since been like Instagram stalking you and admiring you. And <laughs> um, I love the lessons and everything that you're doing. And thank you. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. Can you tell, um, for those of um, the world who are not familiar with who you are, what you do, can you give us like a background, like what's your billboard in life? Like, who are you? I'm Dr. Sanjaya Kenya. I am an associate professor of medicine at the University of Miami, as well as a sexologist and the author of the book Sex in South Beach, which was a bestseller when it was released, number eight on Amazon. Wow. And the goal of Sex in South Beach is to help people have... Fun, easy, and informed conversations that lead to better sex. Awesome. My whole goal in life is to help people have happier, healthier sex lives. Oh, my God. I love you. I feel like the world <laughs> really, really needs you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I, I felt like the world really, really needed me, which is why I became who I became, actually, is I was no one was more sexually disabled than I was. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So can, can we dive into that a, a little bit? Like Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Well, A... I am a black woman, like, from the hood, and there is no place where you find fewer role models for healthy, positive, romantic mm. relationships in the middle of a low-income neighborhood. I was raised by a single mom. Again, no role models for romantic relationships. Mm. Then I was actually forced, and I will say forced, <laughs> to go to all-girls Catholic school until I was, until I graduated, until I was 17 years old, and I was the scholarship kid. It wasn't because we had any money, but, you know, there's another place where you don't learn anything about sex, mm. um, mm -hmm. which is probably why a few of my friends graduated pregnant. Oh. But <laughs> <laughs> I was very, very, very scared of sex, and while I was in high school, my mother opened a business called Divorce with Dignity, which oh. taught me that at some point people could love having sex with each each other love it so much they want to get married and then one day they may never want to have sex with each other again so I felt like I grew up in a situation in an environment with no relationship role models with no idea how to have a good sexual experience I can remember asking our health teacher in high school um, what does it mean wet like girls oh. get wet what mm -hmm. does this mean because I had heard about it and she's like you'll know when the time is right so I was like, all right. all right. So that was really the extent. So I felt um, when I went to college, HIV was on the rampage. Mm -hmm. And basically it was told to me several times, you are a straight black woman in America. You are going to become HIV positive because wow. that's the deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so when I went to college, I really became obsessed with not getting HIV and really trying to have positive sexual relationships. And that's when I realized I have no idea how to do this. Um, and so I really just sort of studied on the side, on my own. Um, during undergrad, I went to UCLA um, and I, the biggest relationship role models I can remember were the Cosby show. Mm. And of course, that's all shit now. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. sorry. I don't know. I didn't mean to swear. Of You're course. allowed to swear. Yeah. We, we I mean, we I promote mean, authenticity yes, on our authentic. drive. <laughs> I'm like, what? The most authentic, you know, what I thought, this ideal family relationship, this is what it looks like when a man and a woman love each other who also want to have careers and a family. And of course, that was, you know, tragic for me when mm. the whole Cosby right. thing went down. But um, when I went to graduate school, I ended up going to graduate school at Columbia University, which is where Dr. Ruth went. Mm -hmm. Now, I can 
tell because you're so, your youthful beauty is screaming at me, girlfriend. <laughs> <You're> so sweet. <laughs> so I know that maybe you don't know who Dr. Ruth is. Oh, no, is. I do. Oh, do you? I've, okay. Trust me. <laughs> at one point I said, I think I want to be Dr. Ruth the, the, there you a go. long time ago. So I knew who Dr. Ruth was and she actually, she actually went to Columbia University mm-hmm. as well. But no one had been around since Dr. Ruth, really, that was helping people talk about sex in a practical way that they could incorporate into their own life and in a real way that could lead to more pleasure. Um, and so I got into HIV research when I was, I, okay, back up. Hmm. I went to school for nutrition. My first master's degree was in nutrition. And I got into that because uh, everyone was obese mm. and I was like, we got to fix that. <laughs> um, so I, re- and at the time, a lot of people living with HIV became obese because the medication started working mm. and the side effect of the medication was body fat redistribution. So they were losing fat in their arms and legs and gaining abdominal fat, which put you at risk for every sort of cardiovascular problem or metabolic problem. So my first research study was a diet and exercise study on HIV positive obese women. Mm. So I realized that, oh my gosh, I saw a lot of similarities between women living with HIV and women going through a divorce. Mm. They were all really pissed off at the guy who they were either getting divorced right. from or the guy who gave them HIV. Mm-hmm. None of them, no one ever going through a divorce ever says, oh my gosh, we're having the best sex of our lives, but we just have to break up. Right. And none of the people I've ever met living with HIV are like, I was having the best sex of my life when I contracted HIV. Mm. So I was in my early 20s. I was in graduate school in New York City and a light bulb went off in my brain that women who are going through divorce and women who are HIV positive, none of them were having great sex. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I wonder if we could teach people how to have better sex. And if we could teach people how to have better sex, would it reduce divorce and would it reduce HIV? Mm-hmm. Would it reduce cheating? Would it reduce relationship problems if people knew how to have better sex? Mm-hmm. And that was the beginning of this journey. And luckily I was in a medical community, a lot of doctors and nurses who have a lot of unsafe sex, by the way. So ladies, just because he tells you he's a doctor does not mean you should have unprotected sex with him mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were telling me all of their sex and relationship problems and I was fixing them for them on the side in a very informal capacity. What an amazing side hustle. (laughs) Yes, in the hall, at happy hour, (laughs) in the hallway. But the reason why this, you see, we're in my office, there's a purple couch in my office. Mm -hmm. Not for patients, it's for my colleagues. The the ones who use it most. You see one of my colleagues sitting on it, but not that mostly. Mostly it's for my (laughs) boss colleagues who Uh come in and need to lay down and talk about their problems. But Um, I think it's really difficult when people are professional, educated people and they realize, oh my gosh, I'm not experiencing the sexual relationships that I want. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, because I'm attractive, I'm smart, I make money. Why aren't I having the type of love life that I want? Mm -hmm. And because I had been asking myself those types of questions throughout my entire life and I'd been working and studying and trying to incorporate lessons into my own life, I just started giving people advice. Um, and they started taking it and it started improving their love life Mm -hmm. and their marriages and their sex life. And then I became, um, while I was still finishing school, I started teaching some college classes. And one of the classes I taught was a very interesting class called reinventing you, which was a very unusual class. And I was the only person who ever taught it. The school at the time, New York University, had this idea they wanted to attract older students to come Mm. back and restart their lives. Okay. And in Reinventing You, we started relationships was part, a big part of that. And what do relationships mean to you? And what are the relationships you have in your life? And how would you like them to be compared to what they are? And that experience really empowered me to think you have something here that you can tell people about sexual relationships and they want to listen to you Mm -hmm. and they they're engaged one because i think i'm a funny interesting person (laughs) the other part is you know i was for i got married when i was 37 years old Mm -hmm. i did not meet the man who would become my husband until i was 34 years old i never really planned on getting married or having kids because i was a kid from the hood who was poor and i wanted to be have a wealthy life and i did not know how to make that happen so i was like i know i can make money and build a successful career 
and I don't need those other things right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Things do change as you get older, your priorities change, all kinds of things change, but I was never in a rush to get married. I was never in a rush to have a baby or have some sort of sexual relationship that was the end all to end all, which meant I dated a lot of bad people. Mm. Not maybe not bad people, mm-hmm. <laughs> people who weren't good for me right. yeah. <laughs> and for the relationship goals I have. I have dated the guy who was married and I did not know he was married. I have dated. I was engaged to a professional athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of my first serious relationships was with a recording music star. Who <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I have made every sort. Uh, I have dated the bartender mm-hmm. who is never going to get another job. You know, oh I have, I have dated the guy who you wouldn't date unless you were stranded on an island because for three years of my life after New York, I did move to the Cayman Islands for three years. <laughs> And all of a sudden, that's when I moved to Miami was I realized, you know what? I don't know if you would date this guy if you were in the United States. Yeah. Oh, my God. You're like, I'm sorry. Just like a sidebar. You're like ticking off all these different types. I'm like, I've dated that one. That done one. that one. That one. Okay. That so one. now it's time. Right. So then I was like, oh, I, I got to start making better decisions. And yeah. I have to start figuring out. But a lot of my fearlessness in my relationships and being able to date was I really wasn't looking for marriage. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking for this one all to be all. And during that time, I was able to do a lot of self-study and to learn a lot about not only relationships, but really the importance of sexual health within a relationship and just independently to a person, how they feel about their sexual health and their sexuality, as well as, you know, within a relationship, the importance of that. And so by the time I was able to get into a relationship that became my marriage, that is my current family, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I was in a place where I was able to incorporate all of these life lessons, the good, the bad, everything, Mm -hmm. and put it together from my mom, you know, owning a divorce company to me seeing a lot of people become HIV positive who weren't having great sex to me making a lot of relationship mistakes in my own life. And to, I think um, the crux is, do we learn from our mistakes or not? I Mm -hmm. know I don't really believe in mistakes. I'm like, it's either a win or a lesson. Uh And I think that's how we have to look at our sexual relationships and everything in life. It's a win or it's a lesson. So when was like the aha moment where you're like, okay, I need to be, uh, what, what, it's America's America's sex educator. Yeah. So that's interesting because then I got recruited. The other part of my challenge, which is not a hard challenge is I have this great academic career Mm -hmm. that I built. And so I was recruited to the University of Miami because Miami-Dade has the highest rates of new HIV infections. Mm -hmm. And I was recruited to build a program to reduce that, to, to address that problem. So part of me being a sexologist and trying to help lay people have better sex is... A lot of people, especially in my world of academic medicine, they don't see how that has to do with academia. They Mm -hmm. want us to work on sex after cancer or, you know, erectile dysfunction Mm -hmm. or, you know, HIV, um, HPV, (laughs) cervical cancer, other problems. But um, to focus on sexual pleasure is something that really doesn't have an academic base. There's Mm -hmm. no sort of following, which is why your doctor doesn't talk to you about sex most of the Mm -hmm. time. It's the one of the areas that they're really just not taught in medical school. They're not taught how to address sex, how to so when I got here, and I've always taught at medical schools. I was in the Cayman Islands teaching at a medical school. When I got here, I had an I was in Jamaica on vacation with my husband and I had an aha moment about a year after I got to the University of Miami. Ah. And it was, oh my gosh. I'm at medical schools because I need to teach all of these doctors about sex because Um. A, they never learned it in medical school. B, most of them are suffering from unfulfilling sex lives. And C, everybody needs to learn about sex in the first place they should turn would be their doctors, Amen. right? Uh, yeah, and definitely. if they're doctor and and I have all access to all these doctors every day. I'm just surrounded by doctors of every kind, whether you're an oncologist, whether you're an OBGYN, whether you're a urologist, whether you're, you know, uh, a gender confirmation surgeon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there's not any type of doctor that I don't have access to. And most of these doctors are very uncomfortable discussing anything that has to do with sex with their patients. So that aha moment was 
if I can't get through to them, that's okay. I need their, them to tell their patients Yeah. that all I need to do is have them tell their patients mm-hmm. that this is available, mm-hmm. that these resources are available. Um, and so it has trickled down, but it, I would say the aha moment happened a lot over the years. Mm-hmm. When I was in New York city, there was the aha moment for my colleagues, the nurses and doctors that I'm working with that were like, I w- had, I wasn't qualified to tell them anything mm-hmm. and they were listening to me and they, and a lot of people, it's not like you're, you're having good sex. No one can tell that just by looking at, it's like, you seem happy in your life. Mm-hmm. And I think happiness is sort of a term. We It's a little too vague yes. and loose that mm-hmm. we use it. But basically, you don't seem like a bitter bitch. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you don't seem like a bitter bitch well, who's mad the, at the, the world. Yeah, but, like the term, like, you know, a well, like, like a well-fucked woman. Exactly. Honestly. And that's, I mean, and I tell everybody, sex, sex, fulfilling sex, good sex, has real health benefits. We can all tell Mm -hmm. when someone has not had good sex for a long time. Mm -hmm. We're like, what do they say? (laughs) She needs to get laid. Of course. Right? (laughs) And it's because they cut us off on the highway. Mm -hmm. It's because they're mean. They, they, they'll, they'll cut you off at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. When I was nine months pregnant, this woman just cut me at the grocery store. And I'm like, (laughs) you're never going to get pregnant lady. That morning. (laughs) I can remember. I mean, there's so many, so you can always, we, it's very, the people, who you're not drawn to Mm -hmm. are the people who need to have sex. Whereas the people who you're drawn to generally, they're giving out all those good hormones. Mm -hmm. You know, they're giving off the oxytocin, you know, the serotonin, the prolactin. They're giving off, they're just oozing all the happy hormones Mm -hmm. that sexually satisfied people ooze, which is why, you know, after a dry spell, you finally meet a guy. You're like, oh my God, this is the one. I'm so in love and he's perfect. And oh my God, your phone just can't stop ringing. All your ex-boyfriends are calling. New guys are looking at you everywhere. You're like, what? (laughs) What? Why is everyone? It's because you're oozing all the good juices. You got all the good stuff going out of you. So um, those health benefits are very, very real. And so in terms of your overall health, the more of these happy hormones that we're able to produce naturally and without drugs, I mean, the level of dopamine that you produce when you have an orgasm, it's more dopamine than you can get from like snorting a mountain of cocaine. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Actually, when they do studies sometimes, you know, with narcotics, since that people have spontaneous orgasms. Because wow, they're doing, yes, because it's activating the same sort of neurotransmitters in your brain. So my goal now is it has changed. First, of course, I just want to help people have better sexual relationships. I want people to stop getting divorced. I mm-hmm. want people to stop getting HIV. And then you want people to, okay, I want you to have more fulfilling sex. Too many women are going around like not having orgasms, mm-hmm. right? And then it becomes now I'm really at a point in my career where it's like, can we not, can we finally acknowledge the health benefits that come from good sex? Right. So we can start having it because people who aren't having good sexual relationships, they are missing a big part of their health and we can see it in the data. We see that they're at greater risk for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes. They they have more money problems also. Mm-hmm. They have more money problems and their physical functioning declines much more rapidly than someone who's in a sexual relationship that has more consistent activity. So I, I guess my question for all of this is, we keep talking about good sex, but what defines good sex in your world? Oh, that's everyone asks you. Like, I mean, sex? are you achieving an orga- orgasm? Orgasm, basically, because, because for like, me. My definition is different. Like, I don't necessarily have to have an orgasm, like, when I'm with my partner, or, like, mm-hmm. it depends. So I think for me, it's, like, true intimacy, connection, feeling vulnerable and safe with that person while we are in the throes of passion, um, achieving or not. I think that's, that's, and it's, you know what I am? I'm proud that you know what good sex is for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, that's very, very good because I say good sex. When people ask good sex, I say, yes, it means for, in the most general sense that it is fulfilling, fulfilling sex for the, for most people from a physiological standpoint means that it produces an orgasm Mm -hmm. and more than 75% of women are not achieving orgasms on a regular basis. And a lot of that is because they're depending on penetrative sex. Mm -hmm. And so I also, so that's one aspect is I think it's like, you know, when you go to the airport, airport, you're Mm -hmm. rushing, you're rushing, and then you get there and you do all things, but then you miss the plane. Yeah. I'm like, ladies, stop it. Yeah. Stop going through all that. And it. then you miss the plane. Uh-huh. No, get on the damn plane. Okay. <laughs> I also think that good sex isn't also about sex all the time. Mm-hmm. You can have good sex. I can t- 
touch your hand mm-hmm. in a way and I can connect with you just like this and look into your eyes and feel your hand. And if you were really into me and we were dating, mm-hmm. this could be enough to produce some sort of orgasmic mm-hmm. response yeah. in you. Mm-hmm. And I also think in terms of, you know, Miami Dade not only has the highest rates of HIV, we have the highest rates of erectile dysfunction. Oh. So I think another thing about good sex is there's so much performance pressure on men mm-hmm. nowadays that we have to remember good sex isn't, like you said, it doesn't have to be about the orgasm. Mm-hmm. We do this activity in one of my classes where we use feathers, and I have feathers everywhere. I'm just taking one off, but even this and it's like everyone wants to know what makes relationships how do you keep the spark alive in relationships that's like the million dollar question right right? and the answer is so simple it's like you have to do the same things that you did before you slept together ah i know it's like oh oh, (laughs) darn real before (laughs) oh my god so it's like i'm taking this and it's like oh yeah i call them angel kisses yeah Desire is not about the big boom, orgasm, no. gush, ooh, yeah. gush, da, da, da. It's, it's about the buildup. It's mm-hmm. about a little bit about the tension. It's a little bit about the... So I once read an article written by a fluid woman, a woman who has had sexual relationships with both men and women. And she said the biggest thing she learned about her relationships with women were that it doesn't have to end mm. just because someone's not erect. So she was in a relationship with a man after, and he was having problems sustaining his, his, his erect penis, his erection. And so she's like, don't worry about it. Let's do other things. And she said, had she not spent so much time with women, she would not have even known that there's so many other things you can do Mm -hmm. besides penetrative sex. Yeah. And she said, oh, my God, he was so relieved. The pressure was off and they start doing other things. And of course, he's erect within she's like a couple of minutes and they did end up having penetrative sex. But the best part was him knowing that they can still have amazing and fulfilling sexual experiences with or without an erection. Mm. And I think that's closer to what you were sort of describing somewhere where you feel safe Mm -hmm. to sexually express yourself in many ways, or maybe sometimes it's no ways just looking. Mm -hmm. And I think, but the word you use that's confusing to a lot of people is intimacy. Uh. And I think what I've learned from the people who attend my events, we do date night special once a month. It's where we take five couples out for a fun night in oh, South cool. Beach mm-hmm. to strengthen their their sensual connection with each other. And what I've learned is that a lot of couples have never really discussed their definition of intimacy. Oh. I had a couple married for 12 years and he told me on date night special two months ago, I finally understand what she means when she says she wants more intimacy. (laughs) (laughs) So that is awesome. Mm -hmm. But I think it can be confusing. And I think when you have relationships with different genders, you know, men and women, we all speak different languages. If you ask men what color blue, most men will say like navy blue. Right. Or royal blue, most women will say like sky blue or teal or, you know. (laughs) Aqua. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So um, there is some of the, so... I think that was, so there were different aha moments. Now I'm at the point where I really am trying to become, which I think we're getting there, the trusted sexual health um, resource Mm -hmm. that clinicians, doctors can turn to and patients. Mm -hmm. More likely doctors will refer their patients. Right. And so to that end, we've done a ton of videos on like sex after diabetes, sex after heart disease, sex after cancer, breast cancer. So you're like, I I feel like there's a, I mean, there's definitely like the overall theme for what your work is, but then you're also stretched into various areas. Very. How do you, and this is more of a personal question, how do you maintain balance and equilibrium in deciding, okay, at which time to apply uh, more focus on X versus Y? <laughs> so I asked this. This is I will give the response. This has been the most helpful response, the most helpful response I've ever received to how do you maintain balance. So I'm going to give you that. But the real answer to how I maintain balance is you're looking at her. There's okay. Brie. 
<laughs> we all need behind like, every strong woman yeah. is another strong woman, Amen. right? Yeah. <laughs> That's my <laughs> behind every strong woman is another strong woman. So Brie is like a life manager, but she really has a job. But she's got <laughs> project managers. So it's really, really helpful to have someone who's invested in most of your projects, even though they're so diverse, whether it's an academic project or maybe some we're doing a community event or we're going to talk to, uh, you know, a group for the Miami Herald about sex or whatever we're doing. Um, so one is to have a great support system, mm-hmm. you know. So now we're trying to get Brie more support because okay. Brie <laughs> needs support. So that's the one. But the other thing is I think that idea of, like, balance and work life I think it's like let's get over that bullshit I'm sorry I don't I'm swearing a lot today, which isn't... I must be bringing it out. I know, I know. Bree's <laughs> gonna, I'm going to say it's not normal and Bree's giving me the eye. Like, let's not lie there. Um, <laughs> um, but when I was pregnant, I asked one of my colleagues who is... She's so ambitious, she makes me look like I'm a deadbeat, mm-hmm. right? She's, mm-hmm. And I was like, how do you do... And she has three kids. Oh. And I said, how do you do this? And she's like, this is how you handle it. You focus on what needs your attention... And then you go to the next thing, and then you go to the next thing, and then you go to the next, and then for a minute, everything's floating along, and you're like, yeah, you know, (laughs) brush my shoulders, I got that, and then boom, something needs your attention, and you focus on that because the other, the other 12 items Mm -hmm. are handled for now, Mm -hmm. and then the minute that one gets to balance, you're like, you come up for air, and you're like, boom, that needs my attention. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's your kid, sometimes it's your husband, sometimes it's the tax collector, Mm -hmm. sometimes it's a work project, you know, so... I think this idea um, that there is some sort of magic key to balancing your life when you are ambitious, and I do have a full-time, you know, professional job, I have a business on the side, and I have a family, Mm -hmm. and I have a social life, Um, and I think that it is, it's unrealistic to think that I just float along, and you're like, "Eh." the other part is, I wake up at five in the morning every day Okay, and that is my me time. Mm -hmm. That is always my me time. And that's where I set my priorities for the day. It's when I work out. Uh. I work, I wake up and work. I literally wake up and work out. I take my coffee with me to the gym. I am drink. I'm half asleep by the time I arrive to the gym. And by the time I leave, I'm widely wide awake. But I also listen to a lot of positive motivation in terms of, whether it's an app or books, I'm a big uh, audible or mm-hmm. audiobook mm-hmm. person, which I used to think people who listen to audiobooks were stupid because why couldn't they read? And then I had a baby. So convenient. And I was <laughs> like, what? And also, there's some data that says people who listen to audiobooks in their car are much wealthier than people who listen to the radio. Well, so, you know, much? give me some data. <laughs> I know all I need is some data. So, um, so I, I do that. I do my audio books, my positive motivation work, my mental balance work, as well as a physical workout mm-hmm. at, you know, five, five thirty in the morning. So that's very, very important. My day cannot start without that. Those are awesome rituals. Um, so that, yeah, that is, that is like non-negotiable. Um, the other part is I really try to, um, prioritize what is going to mean the most in the long term. Mm. You know, there's that theory we're supposed to be looking at our, you know, looking at our gravestone, right? Mm-hmm. What's that going to say? What are, what's your obituary going to say? Yeah. You know, and I definitely don't want to be someone who wasn't there for my child. Mm. I don't want to be someone who was not present in my marriage, you know, and I don't want to be someone who wastes my time all day in baloney meetings. Mm-hmm. You know, one of Brie and my favorite sayings is, that meeting could have been an email. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love um, that. So a lot of that, it, a lot of people can take, um, when you start changing to prioritize and streamline your life, a lot of people don't take kindly to that. Hmm. And so it is a lot of really sticking to your your whys. Mm-hmm. What is the most important thing to you? And sometimes someone really wants my help, but my son wants to have fun with mommy. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, at the end of the day, that is more important to me for the long term. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is, but I can tell you, it's not, there is no magic formula. Sometimes we're here at 11 o'clock at night. Not often. I really, we try our most not, we, not to be here late at night or on weekends. That's like one of my rules. I don't work at night and on weekends. Every now and again, I do. 
because that's what it takes. But um, when you're doing things that you love to do and you really want to do them, they're really, this is not baloney. There aren't enough hours in the day. Mm -hmm. I would love... My biggest disability is I love my job at the University of Miami, mm -hmm. and I love my business. Mm -hmm. So, ah, how do I do both? I'm always stretched, and I love my family, mm -hmm. of course. And so, how do I do it all? Fortunately for me, um, they have come together a lot mm -hmm. in the years. So, a lot of times it's the University of Miami organizing a public event that they've asked me to come to. That happens to also be sort of a Dr. Sanjaya sex educator event as well. That That's um, actually really beautiful. And I'm just curious, have you ever had pushback from? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, psh. they thought I was a prostitute when I first, I mean, like, oh. Oh, so, oh, whenever when you're gorgeous. No, well, my big aha moment, That's this is my aha moment when I wanted, so in academia, back to, in academia, I have I struggled for a long time because I wanted to be smart and mm -hmm. perceived as the smart woman. Mm -hmm. Like when I was young in academia, I used to wear my hair back in a bun and wear yeah. fake glasses so that people would think I'm smarter mm -hmm. and looking and I'd only wear like full suits. Mm -hmm. And so when my book came out, that was my aha moment to the university and to the academic world. I'm going to talk to lay people about sex. I had already been writing a newspaper column for a long time, so people knew about it. But the only reason I wrote out the book, not the only reason, but I needed to come out of the closet, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I'm not just an academician. So I was like, it was my coming out of the closet. I remember when I showed the university my book, I said, I'm going to write this book, and it's going to be called Sex in South Beach. And they said, well, how far along are you? And then I handed them a book. Okay. And they're like, oh, <laughs> I was ready to be fired over it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how that was going to happen. And I think when you decide what you want to do, you have to be at that point. I, this is what I want to do. And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing nasty about it. There's nothing non-academic about it. It's mm -hmm. basically translating everything that we talk about at the medical school to lay people so mm -hmm. that they can benefit from it. Yeah. Um, so that was my big coming out moment. Um, and, from that, I have a very, very supportive boss. He'll want to meet you in a second. He's the chief of our division of general medicine here. And he goes to meetings all the time. He, they've slowed down in the last three or four years. Sometimes he says they want to know, is, they said, is she a sex worker? He says, so you think she leaves the university and goes and what, picks up customers? <laughs> um, what do you think she does? Like, so he, I've been told there's a lot of meetings about this and there's been a lot of, there has been a lot of put giggles and pushback. But remember, I'm working in a place with highly educated people, some of the best educated people in America. Yet, what I talk about makes them reflect on their own lives, mm -hmm. about where they may not be hitting, you know, the mark that they're trying to hit. Right. They might be, you know, batting tens for their salary, batting tens for their position in life, batting tens, you know, their kids are at Harvard or whatever. But when, but what I talk about brings up some very personal issues mm -hmm. um, for, and not every man, and I can say that because this institution, like most medical schools around the nation, is run by men. Um, not every man is so happy um, to have a woman out there openly discussing sex mm -hmm. and how, in a lot of ways, how men need to improve their sexual performance. Mm -hmm. It's not about taking Viagra. It's about learning. Is that the right stroke to use right. to get her where she needs to go? Yeah. And it's hard. You, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there has been a lot of pushback, but mostly now I get a lot of support. It's mostly giggles. It's mostly like old men walking around. Like, <laughs> there she is. Oh, my God. Which they I, probably have the most massive crush on you and want to ask you all the questions. They just don't feel comfortable. <laughs> right? That's what I would imagine. Well, some of them do ask the questions. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but most of them don't because most, I mean... We've had, um, you know, remember that, that, that demographic, you know, older men who are in power, that's the same demographic that um, motivated the Me Too movement. Yeah. So they don't always deal with it appropriately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we've right. had... Um, well, I've been experimenting recently. A friend of mine sent me this beautiful <laughs> gift. It's a Yanni necklace. Mm -hmm. And it's purple. And it, of course, looks like a flower. But I like to wear it when I'm out and around more like waspy type of guys mm -hmm. and so many times they pause and they've stared at it 
And there's only been five times that someone's asked me, what is, what is that? What's, what's on your neck? Mm -hmm. Is that, is that what I think it is? I'm like, yeah. And then of course, like the, the clitoris is like a, a little bee. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and here's the clit. It's very hard to find. I know, but right. this is where it's at. <laughs> and, then, and like, that's my pushback to like, we have it. You can find it. You've got to look for it. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah. So I do find, and this is a good tip for all the single ladies out there. Mm -hmm. When I was single, I found that there was nothing more attractive to professional men with jobs than a woman who could talk intelligently about sex. Mm -hmm. I wasn't talking any about me having sex with them or anything nasty or anything weird because you, you brought that up. They were so, it would like, you could walk, my girlfriends would go out, there was like 20 men surrounding us. They were just so, they they do want to mm -hmm. talk about it. They want to learn about it, but they, they really don't know how to do it in, in a way that's more mature than adolescence. <laughs> Right. You know, so, um, and, I mean, we see this in the old office, how they're talking about, you know, women. Right. So, I mean, it's a very adolescent way that, unfortunately, we've been conditioned to, I say so, the problem. Yeah. So there's so many different layers to it. So right. I, get, I have kind of a two-part question. One is for, more focused on the ladies, and then um, the other is focused on men. So the first question is, with women, you know, wh what's the best resource for them? And for fellas, like, what's the best, co most comfortable resource for them to communicate or to at least learn and then be able to communicate with their partner. Because the people I've been with, a lot of them are not good communicators. And I mm -hmm. thankfully have taken time to like take the reins and know like this is what I'm comfortable with, what I like, and trying to like learn from them as well. I think for women, you have to know what turns you on. You're you are the owner of your orgasm. Okay. And a lot of women, I've talked to many women well over 40 years old who have never masturbated before. Oh, God. And so they're like, so what do you do? You just yeah. lay there and you touch yourself. So remember, you are the owner of your orgasm. Mm -hmm. It's like nobody can paint your house the color until you tell them what color to paint it. Yeah. You have to decide the color to paint mm -hmm. the wall. <laughs> like the painter can't just guess. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to be different color than the person who lived in that house before. Mm. And that's how we want to think about it. Just because this turns your, you know, with girls talking to each other, something might make you have an orgasm that doesn't make me have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think really taking onus, it's like everything. You have to take, be responsible for your whole life. It's just ugh, tragic. I mean, it's so much work, right? <laughs> it really is. You're responsible for everything, but you are, if you're not having an orgasm, you're, it's your responsibility, right. basically. That's because you don't know what turns you on, mm -hmm. right? So if you don't know what turns you on, you have to do the study to find out. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's so many books and resources out there um, for women. But the one thing that I want, I think the one thing that all women should know is that basically if he's not performing oral sex on you and foreplay as part, part, not all of the foreplays, but as part of the foreplay experience, um, you're probably not going to have your ultimate sexual response. Mm. So a woman can only, first of all, a woman has to be very relaxed in order to experience her ultimate sexual potential. She has mm -hmm. to be relaxed. So we don't want a stressed out woman. And so many times women are stressed out. They're stressed out about the way they look. They're stressed out about five pounds. They're stressed out about their hair, their eyelashes, their job, their money. I was actually opening a bank account with my son yesterday, who's six years old. Mm -hmm. And this poor girl, beautiful, stunning girl. She was like, I don't, know if I'm old or if I'm young for me should I be having a kid I mean we're opening a bank account after I, it takes Aww. a long time when with a kid which is how she ended up you know <laughs> doing this and she has a boyfriend but society's telling her that she's too old now she's I said well you're not even 30 yet are you I mean you don't look she's like I'm I think she's 28 or 29 and I said you're a baby she's like I don't am I too old or I said you're a baby don't even settle down yet she's like I don't know if I'm old or young and I, and I thought this is so sad one she's got an education she's got a job she had a great mm -hmm. physique she was when I say like beautiful like just a stunning girl and she's like you could she doesn't know whether she's old or young, whether oh. she should be trying to make her boyfriend marry, we're not. And, and all that is society just, and I was like, yeah. society, that's how they make money is to make us not feel good about ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's like doubt, doubt, doubt. So a lot of times when women are not having the best sex, 
they <clears throat> don't feel entitled. They feel like I shouldn't tell him what to do. I sh no, you deserve the best sex. You deserve. You are giving everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. Yeah. This person is literally inside right. of your body. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more. No, no closer you can get. No more that you can give. You should experience satisfaction from that. And if you don't, you should definitely work on building the confidence and the self-efficacy to say, hey, let's slow down and stop and play a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's explore a little bit. There is one exercise that I recommend to couples, and I have a workbook. It's called Sensate Focus Exercises. And it takes couples through four weeks of touching exercises just with, and sex is not allowed. Mm. Penetrative sex is not, and just so they can learn each other and figure out, do you like when I touch you hard, soft? Do you like the temperature warm, cold? Do you, finding new erogenous zones other than the traditional areas, mm -hmm. people, it goes. But I do really think that women, they should not, use porn as a resource mm. for their own sexual experiences. And there's so many books um, out there, but even understanding the female sexual response cycle. Mm -hmm. So if they Google the female sexual response cycle, starting there just to understand how their body responds when it gets sexually excited. So they can try to, you know, identify these things within their own body because the one thing is they are the owners of their orgasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and they have to be empowered to tell men what to do because the guy's only going to do what his last girlfriend told him to do. Yeah. And he's like, something's wrong with you because she liked it. Mm. That girl liked it. She yeah. <laughs> and the thing with guys, I tell them, the reason, the other reason why guys should become really, really good at oral sex is because you do want to become the guy that no girl ever wants to leave. You want to become the guy like, oh my God, he's such a jerk. He jer but, oh my God, the sex is so That's good. So I can't funny. leave him. No, so, <laughs> you want to be the guy. I, this, this is why I got married. My ex and I joke, we got married because our sex was so good. And now I'm like, please, can you teach every man out there how to like, because, right. because nobody knows how to do it like you. Right? Yeah. Right? So, but now it's up to you. To learn <laughs> what he did, but not, and never tell anyone else that this is how your ex did it. That's the first rule. Don't, good one. My ex did it so much better than you know. But also, um, there's a class I actually teach called Lit to the Art of Oral Sex. Oh. Um, but everyone should take that class. But, <laughs> but for men, there's actually a really good book. Um, I think it's She Comes First by Ian Kerner. Oh, I've heard of this, yeah. He's a male sexologist. I, and I think it's good from, sometimes men just need to hear it from a man. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's called She Comes First because she should come first. Okay. And you hear that? <laughs> yes. Do you hear that? And also, guys, if you, if you motivate a woman to have an orgasm before penetration, then she's much more likely to have an orgasm during penetration. Mm. And remember, women, we're this magical, you know, this magical species that can have multiple orgasms yep. over and over and over and over again. So it's important for men to know what, what stimulates that in his woman. And I promise you guys, looking at her, saying, babe, boom, boom, uh, doesn't. All the movies, mm -hmm. like, oh, because this is radio. So yeah. I I pretended to grab her boob, pretended <laughs> to put my finger in her crotch, and then pretended yeah. to do her. So it, I'm saying, no, that doesn't do it, it for anybody. It didn't work for anybody. didn't work, yes. No. When you crawl into bed and you're, like, start feeling on her nipple, that's oh, it. And it, you see, it's that, look at your response. It's, it's like gross. Neanderthal behavior. And yeah, I hate it's it. like weird. It's like, like I sensual. go back to Janet Jackson. What have you done for me lately? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Seriously. No, I tell this to my husband all the time. What have you done for me lately? And then he yeah. plans a date. Oh, beautiful. Because earn this. Yeah. Earn this. To, this is not, you know. Yeah. It's just not in time. You don't just get it for free mm -mm. and earn this. Mm -hmm. I like that you said that because about your husband oh, yeah. as well. Because many people, I assume, like after marriage, are like, oh, we don't, we don't, one, have to have sex or to like I have to have sex with him because I'm married to him or vice I'm like, versa. bullshit you don't have to have sex with anybody right yeah. there's yeah. something called I think marital but we don't have marital no, rape yeah. marital rape yeah. that is called yeah, but that's not exist. but the point is you want to keep those behaviors going that made you want to be together mm -hmm. that's it you want to keep the behaviors going that made you want to be together in the first place. And um, what may, when you first are attracted to someone, you're like, what can I do to please them? Mm -hmm. What can I do to satisfy them? You're curious. You're yeah. searching. Mm -hmm. you're, yeah. So you want to make sure that um, you keep that because you want desire to continue to build and you want to continue to learn each other, mm -hmm. your, your, your taste, 
your preferences will evolve and they will change over time. Mm -hmm. And being able to discuss those things is really difficult. And to answer your question about communication, that is why I wrote my book, which wouldn't it be handy if I had one right here? It's right here, right here behind us. Behind yes. us. But that is why I wrote the book, Sex in South Beach, is to help people have these easy, fun, and informed conversations that lead to better sex. And each page, each, each article, or each chapter, rather, is only two or three pages long mm -hmm. because the whole purpose is for you to read it together ah. or for you to read it while you're in the bathroom mm -hmm. and then come out and be able to discuss something with your partner. That's good. And you, anybody can read two pages with their partner. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't read, people used to say, can't you just uh, record them? And I was like, okay, so I do have a podcast that I don't do as regularly as you. And I get a lot of crap for not being <laughs> as regular. But I think my podcasts are, one, they are really funny. They're very short. They're most are about 15 minutes long. But you can listen to it in your car with your partner. Or you can listen to it, I always say, like, over Christmas break vacation when you have all your family over and oh, all yeah. that stuff. And you have all this time. Everyone's off work, yeah. right? What do you? That's the best time, actually, to think about how do we strengthen our intimate connection. Mm -hmm. And you can listen to 10 minutes and then you guys can start a whole conversation about something you would never, ever, ever talk about otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really one of one of the true values I see in what I bring to the world. I will motivate you to talk with your partner and talk to yourself. Right about sexual things that you would never otherwise spend so much time thinking about. Mm -hmm questions that you otherwise wouldn't answer and situations that you wouldn't feel motivated. Like, oh, you know what? I am the owner of my orgasm. Mm -hmm. So let me figure out if this technique, I think the first chapter of my book is it's called Achieving an O and it's talk, It's three different ways. Like what makes, what wows a woman? How mm -hmm. do you wow a woman in bed? And we talk about there's the one prong technique, the two prong technique, mm -hmm. the three prong technique. <laughs> there's all different types of ways. But I think reading that with your partner in bed, it's two pages. Mm -hmm. You're like, hey babe, yeah. So what are we doing? One prong, mm -hmm. two prong, three prong? <laughs> of course, you have to get the book to know what those yeah. prongs are. Right. They're not like form, foreign things that you insert into your body. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. Well, um, <laughs> I, I, I know we're kind of coming to a close on our time. Um, and I'm just kind of curious about a few more personal things. Um, if you were going to go back in time and ask a younger, or excuse me, tell a younger version of yourself something, one, what age would you be, and what would you say? I would say be more fearless, which is interesting because someone from high school reached out on Facebook like a year ago. Mm -hmm. She teaches young kids something, and they she was teaching them about fearless women, and she told them that I was the most fearless person she ever met, and this mm -hmm. is a girl from high school I, whom I didn't even remember, but I was so touched wow. that she thought I was fearless. Mm -hmm. And... A lot of people have said, oh, she's so courageous and she's so... It's not that. I'm scared all the time, just like everybody else. But my young, I would say be even more fearless. Mm. Be even like, you know, whether it's a president, whether it's Oprah, whether it's, it's just another human being. They're mm -hmm. shocked at the medical school, how I treat, you know, our deans, <laughs> and CEOs and presidents. I'm like, they're just another person, just like I am. Mm -hmm. I know that a 7 a.m. meeting is good for their schedule, but that doesn't really work for mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're going to try to just, so be fearless because you count just as much as everybody else and probably more to yourself, hopefully more mm -hmm. to yourself. Wow. Yeah. So I would say that, like, be completely fearless. Wow. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then looking kind of like out the car of life on your road trip, like, what do you see coming up? Oh, there's so many things for the future. I'm so excited about the time that's going to come with tomorrow. Like, I'm going to get some more hours to do some more stuff. <laughs> um, but our big project this year, um, we are going to launch an online sex education school. So people can get awesome. all of these. I get so many requests to do things. To I, There's more work than I'm able to do. So I would love for pe people to become empowered with sex education, to learn more, to develop better sexual skills, to be more comfortable expressing their sexuality, to learn everything that they need to learn to have a more fulfilling sex life in the privacy of their own homes, mm -hmm. to be able to share with their partners, and to know that it's scientifically credible, but also our goal is to deliver it in a really practical feel good way that makes you yeah. feel good and is positive <laughs> and upbeat and really asset based based right. on your strengths, mm -hmm. you know, um, <laughs> Bree's laughing because we're writing 
an academic project and I'm asset based. So you see how <laughs> all my worlds come I love together. It. Yeah, yeah. Intertwined for sure. <laughs> intertwined. But I think that's really what's missing in the sexual education landscape is you have people who can deliver sex ed, but it's like so dry and boring yeah. that you want to fall asleep. Mm-hmm. And then you have like, you know, a former porn star who, you know, went to University of Phoenix and she's like, now I am amazing and <laughs> I can teach that. And then people are like, she probably does know how to give head, but I'm not sure that's the best way to learn. And the an orgasm. You know, so I think that in some way, you know, I do have the gift of being somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. I'm someone who actually, I hope when you look at me, you think that I'm a person who could be having sex. Definitely. I think a lot of sex <laughs> educators, you're looking at them like that old, is she ever having sex? Like, I think you're like, who wants to have sex with that person? So I think I, hopefully I look like a little bit, you know, I look like someone who's having sex. Um, and I'm more reflective of our modern American demographic. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a multicultural person. Yeah. You know, I'm a strong woman. Um, and so I think that getting sex information from someone with my background, I'm the only Ivy League educated sexologist and medical professor in the United States, um, but also who's had all this practical experience mm-hmm. with sex right. and with different... I yeah. think I think that combination... Um, can be very powerful in terms of helping people learn how to apply different information and to improve their own sex life. So we're really looking forward to launching that sex school, which is why I'm sort of out for this year. We're like, I'm not doing, I'm doing almost no, no PR, no media, no anything. Cause we really want to build a solid product mm-hmm. um, that can continue to grow and grow and grow. And one of our first classes will be couples massage because I do have this most amazing sense body it's, it's oil. It smells so good. And it does, and you know what? Couples use this all, all the daddies who come on date night. They they buy it after date night special, and then it, it what it becomes is when the husband takes it out at night, the wife knows she's gonna get a massage. I love it. And then that she's gonna get relaxed, and then everybody's gonna get the aromatherapy effects. Mm-hmm. Desire is gonna fill the air, yep. and it's gonna be a good night. I so love I'm that. very proud that <laughs> we've developed a product, a natural product that not only you know smells great, hydrates your skin and all that, but also helps couples have more fulfilling experiences together. That's so beautiful. Well, in all of these amazing things that you've done and you've created and are going to create, like, what are you, this is my final question for you, what are you tooting your horn about? Um, I thought about this. I knew you were going to ask this Mm -hmm. because I listened to your podcast this morning. (laughs) I am finally in a place where I know my worth. Mm. And I... I, this is the first year I've said a lot, I've said more no's in 2019 than ever. Wow. And a lot of it, like we had a huge, huge internationally known museum ask me to do a most amazing thing. And I wanted it because it would have been such, such a scientifically credible, wonderful, huge thing that could explode internationally into big things. But they wanted me to do it for free. Mm. And it, it, that was, mm, 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 that was my yeah. reaction. Mm. Yeah. Because as in a book, another book I read recently, you know, oh, that like quarter of a million dollars or the $350,000 that all that graduate school costs and all of my education costs, you know, I'm going to need to reap you know, some return right. on that. So I think as a sexologist, a lot of my work does happen in elevators, at soccer games, in bathrooms, at parties. Mm-hmm. People ask a lot of questions there. But when people are trying to formally engage you, I think it's really nice to know that I do know my worth and the people who they ended up getting to replace me are all like students of mine oh. who are on their way. Right. They're not there, but they still need more experience, more education um, and a lot more, you know, possess yeah, yeah. before they're. And so I think that's my big aha and growing older as a woman, that's a really great benefit of getting older. Finally, knowing my worth. I don't care what you tell me, I know what I'm worth. Beautiful. Wow. And um, unfortunately for my husband, he does too. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I am like even more like happy that I met you and talked with you. And <laughs> thank you for so saying yes to 
to her drive and sharing your story and sharing all this amazing advice with me and everyone who's going to be listening and watching this. You're such oh, a magnificent thank you for what being. you do. And thank you for coming. I have to blow it up. Thank you yeah. for coming yeah. to the Yoga for Better Sex class. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. You're actually so beautiful. We took your picture and used it, just so you know. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. She's like, of course. Your you husband should. was next to me. I, 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 next to me. I, I, I was like, is this awkward? I don't know. <laughs> I know. He's like in between Brie. Brie was there oh, too. I'm thinking, does she think it's awkward? That my, he's naked. He's got his shirt off because he really Gets awesome. into it, it's right? Awesome. Yeah, that's gets, the point. Everyone was really into it. The, the blindfolds on. I loved it. Yeah, thank you. Thank and I love you. how your world, everything is intertwined, and you seem very authentic in who you are. And it's like, it's refreshing. It's great. Thank you. There's yeah. a lot more of us coming. Here you are. Yeah, there you go. Here we be. Thanks for listening to Her Drive with Cindy Cramblatt. If you want to know more about today's guest or know a fascinating woman you'd love for me to interview, please see the show notes, visit Instagram or her-drive.com. And please, 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 if you love the show, leave a review on iTunes. Thanks for riding along and subscribe to join our next woman and her drive to success.